Let's give a big Fields of Faith welcome to our closing speaker tonight, Mr. Peter Heck. Um, before I get started, I just want to say that uh, it, it has been a blessing to travel a lot of different places, even around the country, and um, wherever you go, the message is the same. Christianity is on the way out in the United States, the New Age philosophy is taking root, young people are turning against organized religion and faith specifically, and if there's one thing I'm quite sure of, you all haven't gotten that message here in Muncie, Indiana. The Spirit of God is alive and well. Praise God for that. We've got this, guys. We ready? We talk about no more gray. God is black and white. The world is gray. God is the solid rock. The world is shifting sands. However you want to say it, it's the same principle. There's something different about Christians. There should be something different about Christians. There are some of you here tonight who are not wearing the name of Christ. You are not Christians, but you're looking for something different. And then there are others of you who are here tonight that wear the name of Christ, but you're going to be convicted, maybe you already have been, that there's not enough different in your life. You've been blending your light with the darkness of the world, and if we as Christians do that, why would the world ever see a need to change? They won't. So what makes us different? Let me illustrate it to you this way. I want you to imagine, by the way, I did all of the illustrations for this. If I wasn't a history teacher, I was going to be an art teacher, and you will see that. But anyway, okay, so I'm in a dark room. I can't see anything, okay? Pretend that there aren't these lights up here that are about to melt my face off. And I'm in this dark room, and I can't see anything. I'm stumbling around, and all of a sudden, I bump into something. Well, I can't see it. I don't know what it is, but I, I can feel it's got a back, and it's got a seat, and it's got some legs. Well, now I know what it is. It's a chair. Now, I don't have any idea what's happening in the rest of the room, but I know one thing, and that is that I am in the chair. Now, once I have this chair, what can I do? Even without the benefit of sight, I can map out the whole room around me. I know that seven steps this way, there's some giant rock wall. And that 14 steps that way, there's a giant canyon that opens up. And 12 steps that way, there's a giant cage with animals. I don't know what kind of room I'm in, but you get the point. Okay, I can map out the whole room because I can keep returning to the same fixed point. Now what happens if I'm stumbling around in the room and I come across this chair and I pick it up, feeling really good about myself, and I say, okay, well now I know where I am. I'm with the chair and everything's going to be fine. And I start walking, yeah, you're laughing. Why? Because you realize two things right away about a fixed point of reference. Number one, a fixed point of reference has to be separate from you. My foot does not serve as a fixed point of reference because, God willing, it's going to go wherever I go. Secondly, a fixed point of reference can't move. You just saw that. Now imagine putting wheels on this chair. I worked really hard on these graphics. Watch the chair, please. There's no, no wheels and wheels. Did you see that? We're going to do it again. No wheels, wheels, no wheels, and wheels. Okay, now, what happens when you put wheels on the chair? The moment this chair becomes part of my consciousness, becomes part of my personality, the moment this chair becomes part of my reality and who and what I am, this chair ceases to be a fixed point of reference because it moves. I can have it here today, and if I want it over here tomorrow, then it can be over here, or I can move it back over here. It's not going to work as a fixed point because I'm taking it wherever I want it to go. This is a pretty simple point, right? It's also a pretty simple point when you think about navigation. Out in the days, stop laughing, that's a good drawing. You can be escorted right out of this gym if you keep this up. I'm not going to put up with it. Jesus isn't going to put up with it, so just stop it. Anyway, primary factor in navigation. Back in the days before GPS, how did you navigate on the vast expanse of the ocean? Did you do it by Frank in the front of the boat? No, you'd better not. Do you do it by the wave? Often they, well, we're going to head for that wave over there, and that's the way we want to go. Of course not. You do those things, you end up like that. And Frank, you can see his head has been severed off of the rest of his body. It was a brutal boating accident. How do you do this? When you're out in the vast expanse of the ocean, how do you navigate? Stars. Yeah, there's like four of you here that I would get in a boat with, because you're the only ones that knew that. Yes, stars is how you do it. Okay, here's my point. Listen. We get this when it comes to a dark room, that you have to have a fixed point. We get this when it comes to navigation on the ocean, you have to have a fixed point, something to return to. Explain to me why we don't get it when it comes to culture. When, we get, when it comes to a healthy and a prosperous society, when it comes to a happy and a healthy and a productive life, we don't think we need a fixed point of error. We can just make it up as we go along. We can decide what truth is today and tomorrow it may be something different. And this feels good today. I mean, the great philosopher Sheryl Crow sings that, right? 
If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. With all due respect to Philosopher Crow, that may be the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. It really is. Not, not to be outdone, we have the great philosopher Lady Gaga that dresses up in meat suits. She hatches out of incubated eggs and we turn to her for our, for our moral compass in our society. And what does she tell us? Doesn't matter what you're doing, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. <laughs> Listen to me. I, I don't know if we've bought into that. If we have bought into that as Christians, we're doomed. On the right track, because I was born this way. You do realize that you were born with an umbilical cord. It chopped that thing off, didn't you? Most of you did. You're not dragging mom along with you wherever you go. Most of you were born with an uncontrollable, uh, well, you didn't have any control over urination or defecation, but you've grown up, right? This is a part of growing up. You see, just because you're born a certain way doesn't mean that that means you can act in any way you want to, but this is the philosophy of the world. The world doesn't have what we as Christians have, a fixed point of reference. You see, the Bible, the Word of God, is that fixed point of reference. And Paul talks about this in the 17th chapter of Acts. Sometimes when you start saying, well, I'm going to quote, quote Scripture, people, their eyes gloss over. Don't gloss over your eyes. Listen to this. These are the principles that must govern your life. You want to be different? You want to be part of the black and white and, and actually believe and live no more gray? This is what governs it. Paul is talking to a bunch of non-Christian Greeks, and he says, here are the basics of Christianity. Ask yourself as I go through these, are these the principles that are running my life? Are they? Paul starts, the God who made the world and everything in it. What is the very first thing he addresses? Very first thing Paul addresses is the question of origin. Listen, we gloss over that all the time. But do you realize that no matter who you are, where you're from, what you say you believe, every single person around you on a day-to-day -day basis wonders about these questions. Those Greeks didn't believe in God, but they still wanted to know what all of this was about. All men want to know the answers to these questions. We're all looking for meaning. And Christians, we have the answer. You see, I, I don't know if you, you're probably not familiar with the name Carl Sagan. Your parents and your grandparents would be. He used to be the big atheist in the United States. You know what Carl Sagan did with his whole life? Not making this up. Dude spent his whole life out in the American Southwest with giant satellite dishes beamed towards the sky, and he was listening for aliens. Now listen, I don't have a problem with that. If you can get funding and you want to spend the rest of your life looking for aliens, by golly, go and have a good time. Now I'm not going to do it, but if you want to, fine. But my point is, do you know why Carl Sagan was doing this? Big atheist, he was asked the question, Carl, why are you spending your entire life out in the desert beaming satellite dishes looking for aliens? This was his answer. Here's a quote. When we find out who they are, then we will know who we are. What's Sagan doing? He's looking for answers. He's trying to explain all of this. Now, I think he's looking for it in the wrong spot. He's looking for it in E.T., a little Marvin the Martian, little green guys with antennas. He's still looking for meaning. Every human being looks for meaning. It's part of our humanity. Animals don't wonder about these things. Turkeys do not wander around the barnyard. I wonder what the ultimate destiny of being a turkey is. They don't think about these things. Actually, they wait another month and shit, they find out what the ultimate destiny is. But anyway, fun. Oh, yeah, like your big turkey fans here. Get off me. You're booing me for that. Anyway, all right. Animals are not self-aware. Man is self-aware. Now, here's the point. This point, people aren't going to have their fe feathers ruffled, but the next one they will. The God who made the world and everything in it, look at this, is the Lord of heaven and earth. That's a big one right there. We have a ton of people in the American church today that claim Christ as Savior, but they have not, they will not, they refuse to make Him Lord of their life. Listen to me, Christians and non-Christians. If Jesus is not your Lord, He will not be your Savior. He wants all or nothing. We make up our minds. Is He the Lord or is He not? Man struggles with this. Listen, man struggles whenever you present an authority that is higher than him. It's why uh, kids struggle with their parents. It's why parents struggle with their bosses at work. It's why all of us struggle with the government. We don't like to be told what to do. And Paul is saying there is an ultimate moral standard to the universe. There is a fixed point by which you measure black from white, good from bad, true from false, yes from no. That is the answer key. That is the standard. I don't know if you've ever paid attention, but these humanists in our culture, they're everywhere. These are the people that believe it's all gray. There is no black and white. There is no right wrong what's right for me today might not be right for me tomorrow and what's right for you is not right for me and so you just keep your mouth shut and I'll keep my mouth shut and we'll all get along at least that's what they they, they argue but if you listen to them they're always saying things like this well I want to be a good person 
We ought to be good people. Every Christmas season, the American Humanist Association, they rent out these bus placards and put up these huge billboards. They think they're very clever. And they put up there on the billboard, this is the phrase, they love this phrase, they think it's hilarious. Who needs a God? Just be good for goodness sake. Listen, that is the stupidest thing in the world. It doesn't even make any sense. I, and here's the problem. We as Christians today are really struggling to call stupid things stupid because we think somehow it's unchristlike. We think that we're, we're offending people if we call stupid ideas stupid. No, there's a lot of non-stupid people that buy into stupid things because those of us who aren't stupid and know that that's stupid don't call it stupid. And we need to call it stupid because it's stupid. All right? You're clear on this, right? And that is a silly... I should explain why it is stupid. Who needs a God? Just be good for goodness sake. Being good for goodness sake makes no sense unless you can define for me what goodness is. As a Christian, I have no problem with that. You ask me what is good and what is bad, well, how do I define goodness? It's really simple. The degree to which your behavior conforms to the character of the Creator, the more like the Creator you are, the gooder you are. The less like the Creator you are, the badder you are. That's how it works, okay? Now for a humanist, they don't have anything like that. Uh, how can you be a good humanist when there is no ultimate standard to determine good from bad? If you listen to these people, you can always hear them saying, we need to support and feed the homeless. We need to care for the abandoned children. They're calling for all of this good to be done and all of this evil to be eradicated. But if you drive them to the wall and stick them to their presuppositions, and some of you hold these presuppositions, you have absolutely nothing in your life by which you can measure good from bad and say, this is good and this is bad. It's all relative. It's a chair that's here today, and this is what's good. But tomorrow, this might be good over here. 20 years ago, homosexuality was viewed here. But today in our culture, viewed over here. Why? Because we don't have a fixed point of reference in our culture. God's word is different. Christians, we are different. We have that fixed point. An ultimate, an ultimate standard. And that is the way we determine the ways that we live. That is how Christians govern their lives. Giant pillars of the Christian belief system. You got them. There's five of them. We got two out of the way already. God is the origin of all... That was the sound of a pillar. By the way, God is the origin of all things. God is the moral authority over all things. And these principles build your worldview. They govern how you live your life, or at least they should. If you want to be black and white, Paul goes on. He does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. This one gives me chills down my spine every time I think of it. Paul is pointing out that the God of Christianity is self-existing and self-defining. Be careful how you interpret this. God doesn't need you to exist. He existed before you. He would exist after you. He is who he is. You remember what he told Moses? When Moses said, who should I say sent me back to Egypt? God said, I am that I am. I always thought that was like some kind of riddle. He's jacking around with Moses. No, the reason he is saying that, you have reached the ultimate when you are capable of self-definition. There's no way to describe him. No way to define him. He just is. That's the God of Christianity. Now, listen. This, this is where being a history nerd really comes into play, and it's very helpful. And so uh, I'm going to explain this to you. The Greeks, and I promise this won't get too schoolish, but the Greeks had, a, they had hundreds of gods. They were just in love with having gods. They would go out and conquer a foe, and after they defeated these people and killed them all, they would actually bring their gods back and worship their gods. Now that doesn't make any sense because you just beat them. So the gods obviously aren't worth anything, but they still, well, we might as well worship them too. And they brought them back. They had all of these gods. This pantheon was huge of all these gods. And they would literally wake up in the morning and say, you know what, we need another god today. So they would go out and they would get a piece of rock. I'm not making this up. This is what they would really do. This really happened. They would get this piece of rock and they put it in the middle of the room. They would say, well, what kind of God do we want? Well, somebody would say, we want a fierce God. So they would chink, 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 and they would chisel muscles all over that piece of rock. And then somebody else would say, we want an all-knowing God. So they chink, 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 and they would chisel eyeballs all over that piece of rock. And then some smart aleck in the crowd would say, oh, we want a fertile God. So they chink, 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 and they would chisel sex organs all over that piece of rock. So you got a piece of rock with eyeballs, muscles, and sex organs. That's a good-looking piece of rock. So what did they do with it then? They took that piece of rock, they wheeled it out into the middle of the room, and they all bowed down and started worshiping it. Now that doesn't make any sense if you're a thinking person. Why? Because between the two of them, who created whom? They created their God. So who is really God between the two of them? They are. 
And what are they really worshiping? They are worshiping themselves a projection of their own personality. You see what they've done? They have determined the attributes of a God that they deem worthy of their worship. So who is deciding what is of ultimate value? They are. They've determined the attributes of a God they want to worship. They formed that God and that's what they're worshiping. We roll our eyes at the Greeks. We think that they're stupid. But let me ask you a question. How many people in your church, how many people that wear the name of Christ have you heard say something like this? The God that I serve wouldn't have a problem with a woman exercising her right to choose. The God that I serve wouldn't have a problem with two people who love each other being together, even if they're of the same sex. The God that I serve, fill in the blank. What are we doing? The God that I serve, ching, 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 ching. The God that I serve, ching, 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 ching. We are chiseling a God that we deem worthy of our worship. We are creating that God and we're worshiping it. Friends, that isn't Christianity. It's called humanism. If that is what we are doing, that is humanism. Paul is saying there is something that exists apart from us. There is a God. You see, this is humanism in a nutshell. Man reasons, man creates, man devises truth, man is God. Paul says that is not the God of Christianity. He exists in and of himself. He's the great I am that I am, not the great I am whatever you want me to be. God does not ask you your opinion of him. God doesn't ask you your opinion of him and then morph himself and change into whatever it is that pleases you at the moment. I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody in the New Age movement. They're all over the place in our culture. If you go to Starbucks, they're heavily, densely populated there at Starbucks. You know what I'm talking about. The people, you go in and they're sipping the mocha java latte, soy milk macchiato, double sleeve, no cup, those people, right? Okay? And they're sitting there. And they've got their Evian water and they're reading the New York Times and they're philosophizing and coming up with all of these. These are the people that say things like this. Well, I am not religious, but I'm very spiritual. What in the world does that mean? It's just people say things and it doesn't even make any sense. Anyway, this is the... Okay, I'll tell you this real quick. We've got time. Um, I, I had a waitress. This is like a year ago at Bob Evans. Um, I don't know why we went to Bob Evans. I guess we decided that we were 70 that night. And so we went to Bob Evans. <laughs> And no one over 70 in the crowd, right? We're good? Okay, so we go to Bob Evans and I had a glass of tea and it did not have any sugar in the tea. And I like the kind of sugar like from the South that when you drink it, your teeth rot out on impact because there's so much sugar. So I asked, at, here was the first, first moment that I knew our waitress was into the New Age movement. Her name was Jupiter, okay? And when you're dealing with a waitress whose name is Jupiter, probably New Age. I will say this about Jupiter, nicest girl you could ever meet. She was the sweetest girl and the best way, she was wonderful. So anyway, I said, I said, Jupe, I need a little sugar here for the tea. If you, could, if you could get that for me, that'd be great. So she goes, and I thought she'd bring back sugar packets. She didn't. She brought back a little dish of sugar, and she took my tea glass, and she put it on her tray, and she started filling it up for me, which I thought was weird, but it's okay. And she just, poof, poof, poof. the problem was that she snapped into some sort of new age trance, and we lost her. She left the solar system for like two minutes. I don't know what happened, but she was gone. And the biggest problem was muscle memory kicked in, and so she just kept going. It was, poof, 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 poof. And I'm sitting there at the table watching Mount Vesuvius rise in the bottom of my tea glass. And she just keeps going, choo, 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 choo. Finally, finally she gets, like she comes, comes to, I mean we're waving at her and everything, she comes to, she even noticeably kind of, oh, and then puts it in front of me and this is what she says. She says, will that be enough? <laughs> Let me tell you something, uh, I have these moments, it took every ounce of the Holy Spirit flowing through my veins. Not to look at her and say, enough, what, to make an angel food cake? Yeah, that's going to be sufficient. I was going to whip up a batch of cotton candy in a little bit, Jupiter, and that's going to be helpful, thank you very much. Anyway, these new age people, you will always know one when you talk to them because they're half here and woo, half somewhere else. If you talk to them, this is the benefit of doing a radio program. Once we started airing in Indianapolis and some of these bigger markets, I mean, you talk to some really interesting cats out there. And if you talk to somebody who's into the New Age movement long enough, this is the question you'll be asked, or some form of it. 
what's your definition of God? Or how do you see God? Or who is God to you? That's the question. And I don't know if you're like me, but every time I get asked this question, I feel the immediate need to step into the phone booth, rip off the shirt, and become super Christian. And i got to give them everything. i got to tell them God is completely holy and just, but He's also loving and merciful. He exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I get so caught up in trying to be theological, I totally miss the point. You know what the point is? Listen to me. This is the point. What's your definition of God? The point is simple. You don't define God and I don't define God. It is impossible for a mortal, finite, created human being to possibly wrap parameters of understanding around the infinite, the eternal, the almighty God. I am privileged to know of God, what He has chosen to reveal to me. That's the only way I can possibly know Him. It is not up to man to define God. God is not a matter of your opinion. Listen, this is key. This is key, this rubs people the wrong way, but I'm really not in the business of caring because this is truth, okay? God is not here to please you. He is here to be pleased by you and worshipped by you. That's the truth. That's Christianity. Pillar number four, Paul says this. From one man he made every nation of men determine the time set for them to live in the exact place where they should live. Paul is saying that this God who is the origin of all things, this God who is the moral authority over all things, this God who is self-existing and self-defining, this same God created you personally. He knew when you'd be born and where you'd be born and why, you knew, why you'd be born. He knew everything there is to know about you. You were conceived in rape. God created you in His image and He has a plan and a purpose and a calling and a destiny for your life. Are you a Down syndrome baby that we now abort nine out of every ten children uh, that, are, that are diagnosed in the womb with Down syndrome? Do you still bear the image of God? You bet you do. Is your life still valuable? You bet it is. Why? See, this, is, this is the thing people ask me, why do I oppose abortion? Why do I oppose doctor-assisted suicide? Why do I oppose infanticide? Why do I oppose euthanasia? All of this other stuff, listen, it's not Republican-Democrat, it's not conservative-liberal, it's not ideological at all. Here's the reason, because God is the author of life and every being made in His image is always worth protecting. Always. That's why. This. This principle right here, that God made, made every nation of men, it's what gives us Christians the weird idea that human life is sacred. And listen, you talk about black and white being different than the gray. The gray is all around you. What happens every day in your school? Same thing that happens down the hallway from my classroom. In Biology 101, and yes, I know that's a math equation. It's the only piece of clip art I could find. So suck it up. I'm sure that they use that equation in biology, all right? Anyway, Biology 101. Kids, you're going to learn a lot of neat things in here. You're going to learn about pistols and stamens and photosynthesis and mitosis. You're going to learn a lot of cool things, but the most important thing that we want you to know, the very first most important thing that you need to understand is that you are an accident. You have absolutely no reason for being here. You have no meaning to your life, no purpose to your life. All you are is the meaningless conglomeration of molecules that came together purely by chance billions of years ago. You see, this is what happened, kids. First, there was nothing, and then it exploded. And listen, if you want to go to church and believe all your silly little things about a God speaking the universe into existence, that's fine. But here at school, here at school we talk about hardened science, observable, testable, repeatable science, like nothing exploding into everything. Clearly that is repeatable, it is testable, it is observable. This is scientific fact. Nothing, by the way, if you're not picking up on the sarcasm, I'm laying it down pretty thick for you, okay? I don't know. And as a side note, sometimes people tell me, I get people that say uh, sarcasm isn't appropriate for a Christian to use. Um, excuse me, I would like to refer you back to Elijah on Mount Carmel where he's confronting the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal up there, and he's, he's, he's waiting. What does Elijah say to him when they're calling on him to set the sacrifice on fire? Elijah's out there shouting, hey, yeah, maybe he can't hear you. A little louder. That's the problem. What is that? It's sarcasm. Go to the book of Job. Go to, I'm not done. You hold your applause. Go to the book of Job. In the book of Job, when God is talking to Job and Job's smarting off, how does God respond to him? He says, oh yeah, Job, you were there when I created the earth, right? You remember when I laid the foundation. What is that? It's sarcasm. If it's good enough for Elijah and it's good enough for God, it's good enough for Peter Heck. All right? So anyway, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's get back to this. 
We've got to get back to our science. What happens every day? First there was nothing, then it exploded. And you had all of this dead material that's floating around in the universe, inorganic material, and it bumps into itself one day and it says, hey, let's be organic, and it pops to life. Again, again, observable, provable, testable science. Every day you go home, your peanut butter just pops to life and starts yakking at you. We've all seen this happen. So you've got this inorganic material, becomes organic, it forms a little ball of goo, and we have the goo stage. After a few millennia, the goo decides it doesn't like just being goo, so it pops out a couple legs, and we've got ourselves the goo with legs stage. But then after that, it grows some fur, some feathers, flies around for a while, flops down to the earth, hunches over, walks around as a monkey, stumbles across a razor, shaves, and becomes you. This is how it happens. From goo to you by way of the zoo. That is why you are here. This is science. So you can see. You really have no point, no reason for being here. You have no meaning to your existence whatsoever. Your existence is pointless and the universe isn't going to care when you die. And when you die, you're just going to become compost on somebody's grave. Oh, wait a minute. There's the bell, kids. Sorry, out of time. Head on down the hall to the new class we've started. Self-esteem. <laughs> yeah. We're going to teach kids to value their lives after we just got done telling them that they're nothing but cosmic compost. So what happens? In self-esteem class, you know this is classic, right? Yes, kids, you're an accident, but you're a good accident. Such a, <laughs> such a good little accident. And the great thing is you have amazing potential for creating more accidents. We just want you to do it safely. Listen, here's the reality. You want to know the meaning of life, kids? Here's the meaning of life. Why is your life valuable? You look in the mirror every day and you say, I'm important, I'm valuable because I can do things. I can do things for society. I, I can do things for others. That's what gives your life meaning, kids. Question in the back, little Susie. And teacher, what about those of us that can't do things? Listen to me, teacher. If the meaning of life is based in what we can do, then does it not stand to reason that those of us that can do less are not as valuable as others who can do more? Oh. Yes, well, those of you that can't really do things, you look in the mirror every day and say, well, I'm important because people appreciate me. Question in the back, little Bobby. Teacher, my dad left when I was three weeks old. I never knew the man. My mom works three jobs just to make ends meet. We move all the time. The people at my school never know when I'm there and when I'm not there. If there is one thing in this world I do not feel, it is appreciated. So if the value of human life, teacher, is based in how appreciated I am, then does it not stand to reason that I'm less valuable than those popular, appreciated kids over there? Oh. Well, yeah, those, you still belong, but don't try to belong too much because then you'll get into self-esteem problems. Do you see the problem? We are teaching an entire generation of young people to try to find the answers within themselves, but we aren't God. The answers are not in here. The answers are out there. And we're confusing an entire generation. Listen. This is really, really, really simple. You want to know what the meaning of life is? You want to know why your life is valuable? It's really simple. It has nothing to do with you. The reason your life is valuable is because the God of the universe formed you in the womb. He knew you. He had a plan and a calling and a destiny for your life. And he cared enough about your life personally that he descended to this wretched earth and died a miserable death on a cruel cross for one reason and one reason alone. And that was just for the chance to be with you for eternity. So even when you can't do things, even when you're not appreciated, recognize your life was is worth the life of God's Son. That is why it always matters. That's why it always has meaning. This is what builds that Christian worldview. And then the last point. You want to talk about a chill-inducing moment. Here it is. So that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him, though He's not far from each one of us. This same God who is the Creator, the origin of all things. This God who is the moral authority over all things. This God who is self-existing and self-defining. This God who created every nation of men, knows every hair on your head. This same God, this same God wants intimate fellowship with you. He wants to know you. What in the world kind of a God is this? Is this the God of Islam that's so capricious and eccentric he'd just as soon wipe you off the face of the earth and look at you? No, not this God. 
Is this the new age idea of God? Hey, focus here, not on them. I have to have attention at all times. Right here. Is this the new age idea of God? It's not even a person, it's just some invisible force that sits out there and buzzes all day long and it's some mystical buzz all day long. No, not this God. Is this the deist idea of God that God started everything, wound it up, and then got bored and wandered off somewhere? No, not this God. Is this the agnostic idea of God? Well, there might be a God out there, but I've never seen him. I, I've never talked to him. I'm not going to spend my life looking for him. Not this God. Listen, guys, listen. If you're a Christian and you don't realize this, if you're a non-Christian, I want you to realize this. Christianity is not a religion. You cannot describe and define Christianity as a religion. Look at the other major world religions. We'll just pick the, top, the, the other top four. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam. Those are religions. Why? In every single one of them, you see man desperately trying to attain to some level of perfection, some level of God. In Hinduism, everything's a God. You're a God, I'm a God, the chair's a God, the ropes are God, everything's a God. Cows are God. I, I don't get it, but whatever. Okay, Hinduism, man trying to attain to this level of God-like status. What about Buddhism? People do yoga and they sit there and buzz and hum all day to try to attain some level of what? To get, up to, it, 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 to get up to this level of nirvana? What is that? Uh, that's to get up to the level of a godlike status. In Judaism, following all of these strict traditions and customs to try to please God. In Islam, doing some pretty horrible things in the name of Allah to bring on His favor. Every single world religion man is desperately striving to reach up to God. In Christianity, it is the only one where God is seen looking down at man in his miserable state and saying, there is nothing you can do to get to my level. Not your strength. So because of that, I will reach down to you in the form of the nail-scarred hand of Jesus Christ. And I will pull you to my level. Friends, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. It is a relationship with the Savior of the world. And the reason... And the only reason we can have that relationship is because He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Who God was in the Old Testament, God is today. And God will be tomorrow. And thank Him for that. Because if He wasn't, and He was over here tomorrow, and then He might be over here next week, how could we ever know a God like that? No, one of the greatest attributes is the unchanging, persevering, all-loving form of an eternal Creator that you and I can know by name. Do you know Him? Would you pray with me? Father, Father, we thank You for Your truth. Give us the courage to embrace it, to stand on it. And regardless of what men may say, we seek not their applause. Regardless of what they say, may we always speak it. This we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, would you stand with me? The band's going to play a song and listen. Listen, I don't know, I don't know where you are in a crowd this size, but here's what I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess one thing, that there are those out there that have been desperately looking for something different. Listen to me, you have found it. This is it. This is what you've been looking for. And then there are others of you out there that have been wearing the name of Christ, but you haven't made Him Lord of your life. You haven't been living by these principles. And you're finding the faith empty. Tonight is your opportunity. Regardless of who you are and where you are, God doesn't expect perfect people. He expects people to come to Him so that He can perfect them. Tonight is your chance to do that. Come up. We've got altar counselors here who are wanting to pray with you wanting to make a difference in your life by introducing you to the only one who can. Would you come as we sing?